The purpose of a company is not to make money. The purpose of a company is to serve a community. You don't do sustainability on top of what you do. If you don't act sustainably, all the things you do are not working. That's a lesson. You need to be opportunistic. You know, if something develops in front of you, go. Don't think about it too hard. Good afternoon, everybody. We have the privilege to have Mr. André Hoffman, Vice Chairman of Hoffman La Roche, to open the second season of this uh, Learning from Leader series. As always, I'm joined by Peter Van Am, the um, author of Before I Was a CEO. Peter, good to see you back, and the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, be here, of course, over summer. We haven't been able to see each other much, but uh, we're back now in school in Geneva and Barcelona and Munich, wherever you are. And I think it's a wonderful start to that new academic year to welcome Mr. Uh, Hoffman of the Hoffman Laos Company, vice chairman, also for a very long time, vice chairman or vice president of the World Wildlife Fund, WWF. I think they've changed their, their name. We can talk about that a little bit later on. And board member of several other companies, but real passion, as you'll discover a real passion for nature. And we'll talk about all of that. But first, a very hearty welcome, Mr. Hoffman, to Learning From Leaders. Thank you very much, Peter. And yes, definitely, you should call me André. Don't bother with the Hoffman. Well, uh, if you don't mind uh, that we kick off right in the middle of the action, uh, André, or Mr. Hoffman, I should say, could you tell us a little bit about how you experienced the last few months? Because, of course, your company, or the company you're vice chairman of, Roche was very much at the heart of what was happening with COVID, wasn't it? Very early on in the crisis. Could you tell us a little bit, could you take us back to March or February and tell us what you were going through personally and also what the company went through? Um, the, the, this notion of um, uh, how do we react to crisis is something that is at the core of um, any uh, well-functioning governing organization. Um, the board of Roche has been preparing itself for this pandemic pandemic for quite a long time. I mean, this pandemic is not a surprise. Whatever you have read, whatever people have told you that this comes as a, out of the blue is a lie. We've had six uh, attempts at the pandemic over the last 10 years. I'm thinking of uh, SARS number one, I'm talking about chikungunya. I'm talking about uh, you know, malaria, I'm talking about uh, dengue, I mean, you name it. These, these zoonoses, these diseases that spread from animals to humans are not new. Uh, and um, uh, we had a, uh, an epidemic preparedness plan in the company that we put in place the moment where the, 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 the virus hit uh, our part of the world. And um, uh, I'm glad to say that we have been able to shift our work immediately online. We had a, a well-prepared system for remote working and um, uh, we have not suffered uh, business discontinuity. Why is that so important? In our case, it's important because we, pr we produce a number of drugs for chronic diseases. So it is our duty to society to make sure that these drugs are available when patient needs them and, and need them, sorry. And uh, it, it, it might have been um, uh, possible that the company would have been disrupted by COVID, uh, by, by the disease, and then suddenly our patient who rely on our drugs for survival would not have been able to get it. So our first objective from the beginning was business continuity. And I'm glad to say that that particular box we have ticked. And, and of course, for your company, more than perhaps uh, many other companies, this business continuity was very important, wasn't it? Because Roche played a crucial part in the pandemic in trying to make sure that we knew where the disease was and how, uh, uh, where people were positive. Uh, isn't, could you tell us a little bit about the activities of Roche that were particularly uh, geared at the virus? So, so um, Roche um, uh, does, has two main activities. Uh, we are a, a drug company, we are a pharma company, and we identify drugs uh, to, I, to bring solution to diseases which are not cured yet. We are very much focused on innovation. We don't produce generics, we produce only um, uh, novel uh, technology, novel uh, medicine. But we also have an important component, about 20% of our turnover, of uh, uh, diagnostics. 
um, diagnostics. In fact, we are the largest in vitro manufacturer of diagnostics on the planet. So one of our business is to ensure that we can identify um, diseases in patients. Um, uh, this has, of course, led us to very quickly develop, as soon as the genetic code of the virus was published by the Chinese authority at the beginning of 2020, we, we, um, we uh, set up about to work to discover a test which is based on a technology that we developed and discovered called PCR, polymerase chain reactions. And that PCR test was the first specific test for um, corona uh, virus infection. Um, as the, the SARS-1, SARS-2, sorry, that, that, that is responsible for the COVID disease. Just, just to get this straight, I mean, it is thanks to companies like Roche that we can even know who has COVID because you make the, uh, the tests or you make the technology that allows for the testing of COVID. Exactly. Uh, so, so that particular test identifies viral load in a patient. We need to take a, a sample of the back of your nose and with that sample and with an automated technology, these are big machines the size of this table who are, who are working um, in, in a sort of uh, as much as possible automated way, uh, we are able to give you a, a, with absolute precision if you carry the virus in your blood. Then we developed later on after that, two months later, we developed a, a, a test which identifies if you have antibodies. In other words, are you immune to the disease? Now, these antibody tests uh, are based on blood and not on, 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 on uh, swabs of, uh, of, of inside your nose. And these blood antibodies uh, determine at what time if you had had exposure to disease. It doesn't really give you 100% reading of, uh, about immunity. It just specifies that you have antibodies in your body. Now, that means that you have been confronted to the disease, but it also means that you probably have got rid of it. At least we hope so. But and then there's a third, let me, let me just finish my catalog, sorry. <laughs> and then there's a, a, a third test, uh, which is an antigen test, which we put on the market quite recently, which is a cheap test with a higher, um, with a, sorry, with a lower degree of reliability, but which allows you at low cost and without the machine I was referring to before, to identify at 97% certainty if you have had the virus or not. And that in 15 minutes. And this is, we've introduced that at the end of September in, the, in, uh, in Europe and beginning of October in the US. And, and that I think is a, a virus which could really be the most important tools yet to manage the infection. Who has it in 15 minutes? I mean, incredible, because of course we always keep on hearing about in order to contain the virus, you need to know where it is, you need to test, you need to trace. And of course yeah. you can't trace if you don't test. And that was a, a problem in the beginning. And so your company made sure that we could actually do those tests now. Uh, and that's of course incredible. Now I want to go back into that mode that you were in back then, because obviously we heard there's so few tests available in the beginning. So you had to scale up the availability of these test technologies that you had of these machines of these PCR swaps, etc. How do you go about that? How did the company go about to ramping up the production of all these tests that were needed? Well, first, I'd like to say that the WHO approach, which goes along the very simple principle, you test, you identify, you isolate, and you cure, is, is the uh, standard re reaction to any infectious disease. And I think that, that, that's, that's obviously the right attitude. You notice you need to start by testing. But if you want to test, uh, originally, we, we, we thought that we should test only people who have symptoms, because asymptomatic patients are just too numerous. You know, uh, basically, you have people who are ill and people who are not ill, who those who are not ill, we cannot test them all. There's not enough capacity there. And Peter, uh, you say that we have geared up our production. Yes, we've increased our production of, uh, of tests by 70 times, so a factor of 70, but we are still a small uh, Swiss company compared to the rest of the planet. You know, the, the, the demands in that particular, in that particular uh, sector are immense and although we work um, you know seven days out of seven 24 7 we we, um, we will not be able to produce much more uh, th than uh, uh, um, a couple of millions a month of the test based on pcr which are the ultimate reference we, luckily the the, the the third test i mentioned is easier to manufacture and there we can uh, we can eat we can reach a proportion of about 15 to 20 million tests per month which of course on a yearly basis starts making an impact but you were right to mention that there were lots of tests to start with. I'm afraid not all of them were as reliable as they should have been. And there's been a bit of confusion there, um, especially as it coincided at the moment when the, the majority of government decided to close borders and not only to free movements of people, but also to free movements of goods. 
as an international company, Roche is invested in a number of different countries, and it's impossible for us to manufacture just in one single country. We have a supply chain which is international. And that was a subject of discussion at an early stage. I mean, I can imagine that like everybody was asking you for these tests and for these machines, but they were not uh, all available everywhere. So how do you go about prioritizing? How do you scale up? Where do you send the material? I mean, how do you possibly do that when demand is so high? So, uh, Peter, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, you, you, this is why we need international bodies. Now, uh, American authorities in particular, but a number of other governments have, to have systematically undermined the activity of the WHO. But this sort of activities, this sort of allocation of resources, this sort of distribution of goods across different nations ought to be in international um, institutional hands. And we as a private company can do our best but when the government of the United States come to see us and say, we want to buy 100% of your production so that we can stockpile uh, tests for everybody in the nation for the next two years, we have to say no. And if we start saying no, we get some very strong reactions. I mean, these are uh, matters of national interest. And so governments have not always been as flexible as we would have expected them to be. Let's Is it be impossible honest. for you uh, to step in and to say, well, you know, this, we have to be fair to everyone. I mean, how do you go about that when you get pressure from like, you know, the most powerful countries in the world? Well, f first of all, you have to, to, to deal with reality. Uh, these tests, the PCR tests in particular, are uh, available to people who have the machines, because if you don't have the machines, the piece of kit is of no use. So that's the first allocation. Um, there are more tests of American types in the US than there are of our type. Well, so, so our test is not working on these machines, so wh wh why sell them all? Uh, wh why, why put them in the warehouse when you can put them up to use? Um, but, but, but really, the, the, the commercial reality plays a role as well. As we all know, uh, the United States of America issued a reference currency for the planet. Uh, if they decide certain things, it's difficult for an international business to just uh, uh, ignore it. So it's a question of negotiation. It's a question of negotiation. It's a question of bringing forward international interest. It's also a question of making it evident, explicit, and as clear as possible that you will not protect an American citizen by, by stopping the virus at the border. The virus will come in, and therefore it's important to also treat where the virus comes from or identify where it comes from. And so there are conversations. I mean, it's a bit like horse trading at times, but uh, there are conversations. That's, of course, the nature of, of business. You have to weigh these different interests and then decide. Let me ask you now where today you said, you know, we can do 15 to 20 million tests in one month. Is that enough? Are we in a place now where there's enough tests available globally? So luckily, we are not the only one producing tests. There are lots of uh, very uh, competent people doing that in other companies and in other, in other technologies, not always using the same technology, which I think is important because we need diversity. But, but um, uh, no, we don't have enough yet. I mean, this notion of testing systematically of the population, we're not there yet. Um, the, 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 I can tell you that in our German factory, where we produce most of the tests, um, uh, we've had to organize our workforce in a completely different manner. Uh, we, people who are working in the administrative part of the, of the, of the operations are coming to st um, uh, pack these the tests during the night. We, we, have been, you know, we had to really sort of make a general call to arm. And that, 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 that's been, first, that, that has worked. We produce at the maximum of our capacity and we ramp it up all the time. But, um, in a sort of anti-cyclical sort of way of thinking, you know, um, I, I don't think we will get rid of that virus um, uh, with technologies like vaccines or, or, or treatment, but it is perfectly possible, and that has happened in the past, that this virus disappears for some unknown reason. Yeah? And then what do you do? If you have, uh, you know, 80% of your capacity uh, producing something that nobody needs anymore, it's a bit of a problem. So this is also part of the negotiation we are just talking about before. Right. And so we're talking, of course, now about sort of the, the scientific and the business element of, of what you're doing. Could you also talk to us a little bit about how you see it as a person now going forward? I mean, a lot of people will be listening, not be, be very much expert on what you're talking about, but very intrigued. Um, you know, should they be confident? Are you confident that we will get through this and, and, and things will get better? Well, I mean, yes, of course, I'm a born optimist. You know, uh, I remember the word of Desmond Tutu, I'm a prisoner of hope. Um, the, the, the situation at the moment is not particularly, uh, there's no reason to be enthusiastic about the immediate future. But, but we can be hopeful that because there has been a, a rather 
unexpected and unheard of uh, solidarity among uh, research uh, organizations, pharma businesses, and, and certain um, governments. I think we are, we are moving forward on a path which will bring us as quickly as possible to produce a vaccine. Now, it's never happened uh, under 10 years in the past. So now we're talking about nine months. I think it's very optimistic to think that we will have something working by the end of the year. And if it does work by the end of the year, it will, we will not be able to produce enough of it to actually have an impact on the management of the disease. Right. So when you I hear people... So, so when, you hear people, when you hear people and when you hear government telling you it will all be fine when you have the vaccine, don't believe them. It is not true. Not only will we need enormous amounts of vaccine, we'll also need to make sure that it is delivered to the right person, injected to the right people at the right time. I don't know about you, but I, um, uh, a number of my friends are already saying, oh, I don't want to vaccinate, you know, dangerous, you know. This anti-vaccine uh, uh, campaign, which started uh, uh, some years ago already, is taking gigantic proportion at the moment. So it's not going to be that easy. It's going to, even if a vaccine is available in the first quarter of 2020-21, which seem, a lot of people seem to hope for now, you're saying it will take a while before everybody gets the vaccine. And so the virus, the virus will stay with us uh, for, uh, for at least another year or, or for perhaps more, more years. Well, it, you know, um, uh, look at AIDS. AIDS uh, hit us 30 years ago. We still don't have a vaccine. Um, lo look at um, uh, the influenza, uh, the, the flu. Uh, we need to revaccinate every year. Uh, and we've not very many uh, success rates. I mean, you know, so, so some of these vaccines have 60, 70 percent efficacy. That leaves an awful lot of proportion. That, that, uh, all things being equal, if the vaccine didn't exist, we would have to aim for uh, 80 to 90 percent of the population to be infected at least once so that we have um, uh, the, the famous herd immunity that we have been talking about for quite a long time. We are far away from that. We're not even at 10 percent yet. Yeah. So it's going to take a, a, a while. Um, you, you, you are a born optimist, though, um, and, and you are also, and I want to go back a little bit in time, you're also somebody who really knows about, uh, you know, the, the animals living together with humans. Uh, I mean, that's one of your specialties and maybe one of your, uh, one of, one of your, the things that you love most is to spend time uh, doing research, uh, being in nature, and the relationship between um, humans and animals and the natural world. You talked about uh, a little bit in the beginning, I don't know if people caught it, you said, you know, these zoonotic viruses. Um, so, of course, you're referring to the fact that this virus is alleged to have jumped from an animal to a human and from there on spread to the rest of the world. Could you just tell us a tiny little bit about that before we uh, get back to, let's say, uh, the, your past uh, and, and your love for, for, um, for the for natural world? Well, there are a number of uh, elements in the question you just asked, and I hope we'll be able to go back to it in, during the conversation. Um, uh, the, the, the reason why the human, uh, the reason why humanity is so weak and um, weak is too strong a word, uh, is it, it, so um, uh, exposed to zoonosis, to diseases that already exist but who uh, are contained in other species, is because we, ha we are an easy and obvious target. Um, if, as we think, um, that particular virus came from a bat which, uh, via uh, live animals in the, in the market in Asia, be it China or, or Vietnam, has gone into the human, um, it's because it's much easier to develop into an unprepared human than it is to develop into a monkey full of already other parasites which protect you against infections. So, so, so the, the idea that there is a, a natural logic to a, a virus jumping out of its barrier uh, I, I think is, is quite a strong one. I don't want to go too much into the sort of uh, nature takes revenge type of agreement, uh, which is of course you know, a, a legend, that's nothing to do with that. Uh, it, it's just that um, we have been as a, as a species uh, extraordinarily successful at colonizing uh, things outside of our normal field of activity. And that has created opportunities for the interface between nature and human to develop. It's developed uh, at the cost of, of nature at certain stages, but also at the cost of humanity at certain stages. It is not the first time that we have a disease. I mean, um, our North American friends have uh, succeeded in, in uh, removing practically the totality of the Indian population just for disease, not so much for war. Right. And so, of course, for you to talk about uh, that uh, relationship between the human and the natural world, 
Of course, you don't only get that from books or because you studied it at university, but it's something that really goes back to your, um, your childhood, doesn't it? Uh, because you, I believe, uh, spent a lot of your time in childhood in uh, or very nearby uh, a natural reserve in France, isn't that right? No, absolutely. So, so yes, um, for, for me, the, the, the key uh, um, aspect of what we're discussing here is this notion of sustainability. How can we build a system that survives itself, that is robust, that has a certain amount of ongoing capacity? Um, I come at this from, from the natural world. My father was a, a, a research scientist in zoology, in particular specializing in birds. And so um, my sisters and I grew up in a nature reserve um, in the south of France, in the delta of the Rhone River in the Camargue. And, um, and there we were confronted rather early on about this notion that nature and the interface between nature and human, the interface, sorry, between human and nature is an important, is, is an important, uh, is an important consequence of how we live our world. And um, I think that approach to sustainability was very helpful to me when I came into a more business environment when I graduated from business school, I graduated from INSEAD, and wh when I joined the, the board of our family company, um, the idea of uh, protecting nature was 50 years ago a nice concept, you know, it was a nice to have, it was uh, lovely, nature, animals, uh, the lion, etc. Today we are more and more realizing that it's an integral part of the system. Humanity will not survive very long in a, in a non-functioning nature and the COVID is a good example of this that disease would not have spread to a healthy functioning humanity so right. so yeah the, this notion of natural history and natural consequences has been an important uh, uh, influence in my life and and it's been an influence as you said uh, you know early on in your family uh, life. Uh, then afterwards, however, you did choose, like many of the, the students that are present here today, to go and study economics and business in university. Why that choice? If your if your past or, or your childhood and your your family is interested into, let's say, uh, ornithology and 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 the natural world, why did you choose then to go and study business and economics? Well, uh, one of the reasons was, of course, the fact that my family owns Hoffman La Roche. And, you know, the, 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 this is a responsibility which is far bigger than just going to clip the coupons to get your dividend paid. You know, there, there is, a, there is a, a, a certain call at, a, a, at a getting involved into the way the business goes. And that was certainly the origin of the, of the decision. How, do, how can I talk to business people if I don't know about business? So let's go and, 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 and read about this. Let's go and, and learn about this. But that has changed over the years. Today, I know quite clearly. So my MBA was 35 years ago. So now I know quite clearly that um, uh, the, the, the reason why uh, natural system, but also social and human systems are under pressure is because we are, we are demanding too much from these systems. And the, the business community um, uh, has to step up to a way of introducing the sustainability we've just discussed. Right. Uh, when I went to business school, I was taught the Milton Friedman doctrine. As you know, it's, it was 50 years uh, last Sunday that we published a famous article, which was called The Business of Business is Business. So um, 50 years ago, we had, uh, the, the, the School of Economists from Chicago enshrined this very simple rule. The role of business is to make money. And that money is then given back to society who deals with the externality and with the, with the collateral damages created by this value creation. Yeah. And I think that's wrong. You know, this is just not the world the world, the, the world works. We need to introduce sustainability into the way we do business. The role of a business is not just to make money. The role of a business is to be a net contributor to society. And yeah. uh, that, that, that's one of the one reason why I thought that, um, how can I say that, merging the two worlds would be a way of bringing some sort of um, societal progress. André, you, you of course did your economic studies, but then rather than going into business, you actually went to work the first few years of your career, I think, at the reserve um, or the uh, foundation that your father right. had created. In, 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 in France. Yeah. Is that something that you would recommend to others as well as they seek their first career experience is to do something outside of pure business and to go and look for those kinds of experiences? 
Uh, well, two, two things. Um, first of all, the, the reason I, 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 I became administrator of the nature uh, of the research institute my father had created in the Kamang is because the, 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 the director was, it was taken ill at very short notice and we needed a replacement. And so I, I, I stepped into his office for a couple of weeks, which ended up being nearly two years. So, you know, that, that, that's just a, um, and that's a, that's a lesson. You need to be opportunistic. You know, if something develops in front of you, go, don't, don't think about it too hard. So, 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 so I, I did that. Now, um, uh, in those days, the differentiation between profit and non-profit was perhaps bigger than it is now. Uh, the, 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 the research institution was a, a non-profit, a foundation. So when you are a business uh, student, the idea of going into a non-profit is not a natural thing to do. I'm glad to say this has changed. Today, if I look at the statistics of one or two of the business schools I look at, uh, there are more people interested into having impact rather than just having financial success. So, so the Milton Friedman doctrine is under stress at, at all levels, and maybe, we, again, we will talk about this later on in the conversation. But, but for, for, for me today, the idea of uh, being a, pro, a, a good uh, manager is to be able to listen to different audiences, and it's also to be able to react in different situations. So you should not just manage whatever enterprise you're in on financial lines, you should also look at social, human, and natural capital. And whatever yeah. can help you to increase the size of the toolbox for dealing with these capitals is something positive. So yes, my advice would be try something different before you go into business. And, 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 and gather various experiences, right? Because after you had that experience in the Camargue, in that natural reserve working for the foundation, you did in fact go to the financial center at the time, still is a big financial center, London, and you went to work for a, a financial firm. Um, so, so you did gather all those various experiences and you got to know, as you say, you know, the financial capital, the natural capital, uh, uh, social capital, and so on, just from also your work experience. Yes, I, I think I realized after having spent two years in the Camargue in, in, a, you know, in a job I was sort of uh, uh, propelled in, not the job that I actually deserved, but well, I mean, I did a decent job, but you know, I was, I, I was uh, sort of elected to it rather than, 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 uh, than pushed for it. Uh, I realized that if you really wanted to change the system, if you really want, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a system change. We cannot continue the way it works. We just talked about the COVID crisis, but the COVID crisis, uh, the world was in a crisis before that, you know, the, the loss of nature, the, the, the climate change, the, 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 the disruption at the social level, the overexploitation of part of the population by the other part of the population, uh, gender disparity. I mean, all these things are already there and they are each one of them, uh, you know, a bum, a bum starting waiting to explode but, but um, if you really want to change the system you need to be where it is and it is more in the financial community than it is in the in the ornithologist community in the Camargue so go, going to where it happens I think was quite a natural thing to do and were you able to affect that financial world in any significant positive way just by being there with that mindset well, that's a very interesting question. When I arrived and I talked to my colleagues and I said, look, we have to do something for nature. Um, what I was told most of the time was, come on, uh, this, is the, this is the room, this is the boardroom, this is, this is where it happens. Nature is there, you know, in Africa, in the Camargue, uh, the birds are there. This has nothing to do with us. We, we are making business. You know, we are, we, we, we. And, and, and I think that perception. Uh, that humanity or, 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 or any type of business cannot exist without nature is something that is slowly sinking in. We see that happening more and more. But at the time, it certainly wasn't. At the time, it was really, you know, let us make money and we will give money to charity who will then look after nature. Yeah. Now, you have uh, tried for yourself with your own initiative as an entrepreneur um, to, to merge sort of the idea of sustainable business, haven't you? Because after you worked in, in London, in the city, um, you had a stint at Nestle, a very large consumer firm. We'll talk to its chairman later on this, uh, this year. Uh, and after that, you started a recycling startup, or I should say so, a, a, a recycling for wine bottles. So, so I, the sequence is, 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 is not quite correct. I, I, uh, I left the city, started this recycling company while applying to business school, and then went to business school and then went to Nestle. And that's a cycle. Uh -huh. yeah. And so, <laughs> and how... <laughs> And, and could you tell us a little bit, so you have that idea, I want to do something sustainable with business, this startup uh, in recycling, uh, recycling wine bottles. Um, tell us a little bit about that process and how that went. 
So, so um, uh, first, there is a very important principle at stake here. Um, if you want to change the way things are done, you can wait for the regulators to do it. You can wait for social pressure to do it. You can do it for consumer to wait it, or you can start an uh, an initiative, which by demonstrating the viability, the materiality of your idea, can help uh, speed up the process. In those days, nobody recycled glass bottles in in London. I thought this was a business opportunity. You take empty glasses, you bring them back to the bottle bank, I'm simplifying of course, and from bottle bank you then export them to the winemaker and you make a margin on this which creates this virtuous cycle of people recycling more. And so using the power of entrepreneurship to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to apply to certain pockets of inefficiency into the way we run our natural resources or our resources schemes in general, I think that's a very potent way of changing the system. You, you, you're actually creating a business opportunity out of a societal need. And, and that was the thing that really sort of attracted me at the beginning. How can we, how can we um, uh, use new type of forces to bring forward uh, uh, an agenda? How can a private enterprise influence a public good? Yeah. And so that, 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 that's how we start with this. And uh, I, I, I wrote my business plan. I went around the different vendors. I found a couple of people who were able to help me. And we started a very, very simplistic scheme. Today, to, today you, you would laugh at it. But we realized rather quickly that um, the great problem, and I mean, it's, it's a bit of a funny joke, but the great problem is that English people import wine, green bottles, and export whiskey, white bottles. And so the two did not mix. <laughs> So we couldn't find enough takers for our green bottles, and that's why we folded rather quickly. Yeah, so you had that idea though, but you didn't really give up. Of course, you closed the business, I suppose, because it wasn't uh, viable. But then afterwards, you, you started up a couple more companies, and one of them actually did become successful. Could you tell us a little bit about, about that one? I believe it's a soup company. Yes, so, so uh, when we were, I didn't say that, there was a, a, a little group of, of people who were very interested in entrepreneurship in the, in the broader sense. And uh, one, one of my colleagues um, who graduated six months before me uh, went to, uh, to, to UK and developed a concept for uh, um, soup in a carton. It, we called it the New Covent Garden Soup Company because it was all done with fresh vegetables and it was in the chill part of the cabinet. So uh, the idea was new, because, sorry, when I, I mean it was in the supermarket, in the chilled section and not in the uh, ambient section. In the ambient section, you had uh, soups in a tin and in the chilled section, something fresh, something new. A, so, a sort of a, uh, uh, the salad, but the warm salad. So for the UK weather, probably more appropriate. And, and we, 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 we hit, um, we hit a, a trend there. A, lo a lot of people were, were sort of interested in this and we grew it to a size of a business and we sold it to, um, to Unilever. And was that a sustainable business? That was a sustainable business in as much as um, uh, by, you, by sourcing products um, locally, we were able to develop recipes which were uh, more involved into what people wanted to, to eat normally. Now, is it a sustainable business to create uh, tinned products, or in that case, uh, products in a carton, in a, in a, in a, in a tetra pack? Um, uh, probably it would be more sustainable if you were to cook them yourself at home, but at least it's a halfway house. It, you know, if you come back to this idea of, about capitals, um, I think one of the biggest issues we have, and again, we will probably go back to that later, is, is an accounting problem. If the only way you, you, you look at producing this, this soup is based on financials, you know, raw material that much, time that much, and, uh, and uh, retail price that much, and we do a, co a combination, we, we value the economic factors to its best possible ability, but we don't take into account the, the social impact, i.e. the farming community, which has to produce these vegetables, uh, the natural impact, how much pesticide do we put in the field. You know, all these are unaccounted for. They're supposed to be reflected in the price of the vegetables when you buy them. But that, as we know, is in an imperfect, an imperfect system. Right. So you talked a little bit about this idea of what gets measured gets managed. And you said, you know, when we only measure financial performance or, or, or returns, then we're only going to manage for those. Um, now, you, of course, had a chance to do something about that quite directly because you were fortunate, of course, to be able uh, to put those ideas into practice uh, as a major shareholder of a huge, huge company, which is uh, Roche or Hoffman La Roche. 
uh, in Switzerland. Um, and so at some point you actually did that. You went to take on a role uh, at uh, this company. Could you tell us a little bit more about how that went and how you were then able to change, let's say, what gets managed in the company? So, so the, the, this notion of what gets uh, measured gets managed is absolutely fundamental. And we, we, need, we need to, to, as I said, it's an accounting problem. We need to find a way of doing that. But again, that later. My, my, my story, uh, uh, I've been elected to the board of our family company 25 years ago, um, um, 25 years ago next year. Um, I, um, uh, when we arrived to the board, we started talking about the importance. When I say we, me and my cousin, we were elected the same year. We started uh, trying to talk about uh, the impact we had on society, and we created, 50, 10 years later, after quite a lot of conversations with management, a committee, a board committee. That committee, Sustainability Committee, was created 16 years ago, and was one of the first of the big uh, Swiss companies having such a committee, um, so, uh, Sustainability and Governance. And by doing this, we signal to the organization, which employs 98,000 people, we signal to the organization that these matters mattered, they were important. So then we set about demonstrating the materiality of this, not just saying it's important because we, we like nature, but saying it's important because it has an impact into the way we conduct business. And we found that um, subscribing to a, 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 an index became an important way of pushing that notion. So we participated to what was just started at, starting at the time, the Sustainable Asset Management, SAM, uh, Dow Jones Sustainability Index. And, you know, these guys send you a questionnaire, it's about 150 pages, you fill it in with all sorts of criteria, models, impact assessment, CSR, as it was known in those days, so corporate social responsibility, and, and, and you get a score. And we, we won that particular um, uh, classification, so we were the pharmaceutical sustainability champion uh, at the Dow Jones Index for 10 consecutive years. So the first time we won it, we were pleased, the second we were delighted, the third we were ecstatic. Uh, but after 10 years, it's in the gene. It's, it's, it, you know, when you take a decision, you take a decision based on sustainability criteria, not because you want to win the award, but because you know that that is the way you do it in the company. It's, 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 right. it's embedded. And that particular thing has helped us a lot at the time. Today, you don't need that anymore because everybody recognizes the importance of uh, what we call now ESG, environmental safety and, and governance. But if, in those days, we needed to be able to demonstrate to our employees, uh, to our staff, to our colleagues that this mattered. Yeah. Now, I want to get to the questions of students also because they're, they're going to be asking you a lot about this idea of how, how do you make a sustainable business but maybe just to close this conversation, uh, you're a proponent, I believe, of stakeholder capitalism. The idea that you don't just uh, create financial short-term re re um, returns for shareholders, but also generate um, well-being and, and, and uh, prosperity for a larger group of share uh, stakeholders. Now, my question to you is very simple. You are a large shareholder. Why are you so fascinated by this idea of stakeholder primacy rather than shareholder primacy? Hallelujah. This is the question I've been waiting for. <laughs> um, um, three things. Uh, the purpose of a company is not to make money. The purpose of a company is to serve a community. In our case, we are serving the patient and the patient needs new ideas that will help him to give back to health. So we, we are working for the patient, not for the, for the profit and loss. Number two, um, businesses, companies, I remind you of the original Latin term of company, compane. These are people you eat bread with. You know, these are people you work with. These are people you have a community of interest with. A company is not only there to serve shareholders. A company is there to really serve the community. And thirdly, the most important thing, and this is one thing where I'm putting my neck a little bit out, shareholders are not the owners of the business. That is a legal, simple consideration which does not reflect the reality. Uh, we, we exist because we are supported by a quantity of people who are much more important than the, the uh, legal owner of a piece of the business. Um, in, in developing countries, when we provide a, a salary to a household members, we're providing livelihoods. Uh, and everybody in the, in the family is a stakeholder of our business. Uh, yeah. you know, 
I, I can give lots of examples, but I, I am profoundly convinced that this idea that uh, short-term profit maximization, in other words, you give me money and I will maximize your return as quickly as possible, is, is what has led us in the crisis in which we are now. Short-term profit maximization has destroyed the planet and has allowed COVID to come into our lives. And I think yeah. we, we need to be quite clear about this. So if you want to address the systemic changes needed for, for a, a better society, a better rebuild, as we're doing at the moment, we will need to get rid of this notion of short-term profit maximization and ownership. We, we, we are all citizens of a, of a planet where public good matter more than private goods. I mean, this is an extremely powerful statement, and especially to come from somebody like you who is directly affected uh, by this idea of shareholder versus stakeholder primacy. I, I want to just see the, where the rubber uh, hits the road. Paco Chana, an, an MBA in entrepreneurship at, uh, at, at your business school that's following us right now, he's asking, well, if you now look at what that means today for <coughs> Rock, that is making products that are helping to combat COVID, but at the same time, of course, they need to be able to charge for them or they can't make them. Um, they need to, in other words, be able to generate a profit uh, or they can't serve the public good. So how do you balance that very interest that you're talking about in a moment of crisis? Sure. No, I, 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 I mean, uh, I never say that capitalism is a bad system. I'm saying capitalism, as it is conducted now, is a bad system. We need to, uh, we need to amend our capitalism and we need to continue to be able to take this entrepreneurial risk, which is the key to, to all this innovation we are just discussing. I mean, for, for me, it is absolutely essential to, to, for a company to make a profit. If it doesn't make a profit, it's part of the problem, not part of the solution. So, so yes, we can bring new solutions to the market as long as the market pays us back the opportunity to do it. And, and it's not a question of saying we are all equal and we all need to, 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 to have the same amount of money in the bank. It's a question of saying we are going to use the system as it is to help people in this, in, in, without any discriminations. So yeah. um, uh, uh, if I am following the principles of Milton Friedman uh, and I have a drug that will cure people, I double or quadruple ripple or quintuple the price as much as the system can bear because it is needed. We, we do not react in that way. We, the, the tests we do for COVID is the same price as any other virology test that we do. We have not sort of um, put in place uh, um, uh, emergency pricing or, or opportunistic pricing. You know, yes, we have provided a product which allows to test if you have COVID or not, but we're not selling it at an extortionate price because that would be against the principle. So, right. so the, the idea is just to live your values. You can be a successful entrepreneur. You can be. You, you can continue to drive your company following several crises as long as you deal with your values. We define our values at Roche in a very simple way. We want to have courage. We want to have integrity, and we want to have passion. And these three things together is what guides us. Now, if I am in Tigre, I'm not going to charge you because you need me. I'm going to charge you what it costs me. Otherwise, I'm I'm I'm, I'm breaking the system. Right, right. I think that's a very important notion. You know, you do believe in capitalism, and that doesn't mean uh, that uh, uh, you have to uh, uh, make extortion prices at the moment that it's possible. No, you can just uh, ask a fair price, and that's possible. Can we maybe turn now to some students that are live with us uh, because they also have questions? Let me first turn to Olivia, uh, who's uh, from the Netherlands in Geneva, and she's got a question about, I think, your key topic sustainability. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Hoffman, and thank you, Van P and Peter Van Ham. Uh, I was wondering, in what way does Hoffman La Roche contribute and aim to tackle the United Nations Sustainability Goals? So, so we are, sorry, you're gone. No, oh, um, uh, just just SDGs. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, well I mean, um, uh, we we have to to we haven't spoken about SDG in our conversation until now. Um, so, the United Nations, which is supposed to be the body that unites us all, um, uh, ha has um, come up with a, 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 a system of goal setting to be able to help uh, humanity's development in in a particular way. The previous attempt at doing this was the Millennium Goals, which were defined at the end of the 90s and which matured in 2010. And uh, their aim was to uh, impact poverty. And it, th there's been a success, you know, I mean, uh, 800 million people in particular in China were taken out of the $2 a day uh, at poverty level into, into some sort of beginning of middle class, um, which, which, which is a success. 
But the people uh, at the United Nations and in the business community realized at the time that that particular success was, was uh, at the cost of uh, natural resources, uh, social systems, uh, uh, disparity, um, and, and that uh, the next step of development would have to be done in a harmonious manner. So Ban Ki-moon, at the time Secretary General, co um, commissioned a study. Um, uh, there was a, a, a workforce being set up between NGOs, businesses, and the United Nations. And this notion of sustainability development goal, SDG, came out. So there are 17 of these SDGs, and they cover all sorts of aspects in, 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 in development in order to give them a framework which would allow businesses to contribute to a, a, a more prosperous world. And um, uh, I mean, I applaud that 100%. I think this is a very interesting uh, approach, and it comes back to this conversation we just had about you manage what you measure. Um, if you have goals, and as you know, each one of these goals is declined in targets, specific targets about what can be achieved in which sector, uh, each one of these goals is an important one. Uh, until six months ago, we scored reasonably well in three out of 17, and now we're back, uh, back, significantly back in all of them. No, goal number one, em eliminate poverty, is going to be much more difficult to achieve because of the shutdown of our economy over the last nine months and probably for some time to come. So, so this is all, uh, the, 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 we know we need to put a, a little pinch of salt into all this. But um, how do we address use SDGs? Of course, um, um, uh, you can look at the specific health one, you can look at the specific working condition one, which is SDG, I don't remember them all, I think it's 11 if I'm not mistaken. We can look at the gender equality one, which is SDG 7. Um, SDG 17, uh, co collaboration, uh, this is something we practice as much as possible. Don't just try to do it all on your own, but collaborate. The COVID crisis is a good idea. We, 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 co we closer to a, to, a, to a solution because we have collaborated. Yeah. But, but uh, 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 all this to say that um, um, uh, you cannot identify them individually for too long. They really are a whole, they are a continuum. They are, they are, you need to have, have a holistic approach. And by, uh, we were talking about values in the question just before, by using our values to manage in the best of our, of, of our stakeholders' interest, we are subscribing to every one of them. And we are trying to make an impact on all of these goals. In our annual report, we, re we report among the five ones in which we have the biggest um, uh, effect, but we also report on the 17 one in which we have an impact. Yeah, uh, Andre, that, that, that I think I'm sure that many people are going to find this very interesting. And, and as a matter of fact, I, I know that's the case because Melita Tagaudi, um, if she's from Georgia, is studying at EU Barcelona, I believe is a follow-up question about this idea of the different pillars of sustainability uh, at Roche. Melita? Uh, hello. Um, well, uh, it is clear that your company takes sustainability very seriously, and it's great, especially for me since I'm a sustainability major. And I wanted to ask, your website mentions that you don't have a specific department dedicated to sustainability. Rather, you try to incorporate this concept into everything that La Roche does. So could you please explain why is this a better approach to incorporating the concept of sustainability and improving your CSR? And if you could give us some examples of how that is implemented in your company. Of course, uh, I, I think that's, that, that, that's um, uh, absolutely fundamental. Um, you, you don't do sustainability on top of what you do. If you don't act sustainably, all the things you do are not working. So, so, so um, the idea of saying, I, I do a bit of marketing because I need to sell more, so I do a bit of sales and then a bit of marketing, and then a bit of sustainability on the side, it's like if it was an afterthought. It's like if it was something that's not really core. Uh, thinking sustainably, is the core of what you do. Uh, I will not um, overexploit a, a part of the population because that is not stable, it's not sustainable. So the idea uh, of exploiting, I don't know, um, uh, one community exploiting the other community is, is um, a, an easy way to maximizing income because uh, the, the, the strong one wins, but it is not a very stable way of measuring your success in the long term. So if you want to have sustainability, you don't do that. Now, uh, I, and there are a number of companies who do that, uh, you, you, you behave in a bad way and then you put on the side a report which says we are not sustainable, doesn't strike me as being particularly helpful. You really need to put that together, I think. 
So you ask us, how do we do that in, 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 in OSH? Um, we, uh, we try to encourage people when they have taken new decisions, when they take new, uh, um, sorry, I'm talking management level, of course, at, 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 at a lower management, at a lower level, the, the, the measurement will be different. But at a management level, when you take an investment decision or when you try to put in place uh, some sort of policy to manage risks, you need to have some indication how to do it. Um, if we build a new factory, we look at net present value, we look at discounted cash flows, we look at residual values after 15 years or 50 years of using, etc. But we know that the world is not like this. We know that the world is not only limited to the financial value of an asset, but it's also in, in interested into the impact that these assets will have on the natural and on the social capital. So we have a, a, a way of doing this in-house, which we apply, and we try to value uh, our investment decision based on these three capitals, the financial, the social, and, 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 and the natural. But what we really need is something which will allow us to do that across all companies and at the time of decision, not just in reporting, but also in terms of when you take the decision. And um, yeah, we have our own house system, which is transparently ex explicited in our annual report to take that sort of decision according to those lines. And then maybe as a follow-up question to that, um, you know, we get a question from Pascal Schwenk, one of the students at EU Barcelona, and he's asking, well, you're operating with Rush, of course, all around the world, including in, in, in countries perhaps where sustainability is not as important as it is for you as a company and, 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 and the place where you're from. Uh, take the example of China, he mentioned, where you have a, a site in Suzhou. Um, how are you able to make such sites in countries that may not always have the same uh, preference for sustainability or a different view on it, how are you able to have those sites operating at the same levels of excellence in terms of sustainability uh, as in other places? So, so I think we, 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 there are two answers to give you on this. First, we have to kill off this myth that um, uh, China is only interested in, in growth and profit. That is not true. Um, the Chinese government exists since 5,000 years. They've gone through collapse a couple of times before. They understand the limits of, uh, of ecological dimension. And uh, yes, there have been horrendous cases of, of, uh, of uh, poisoning, of pollution, of habitat destruction. But in general, the, 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 the track record of the U Chinese administration is not bad. And I, I know that when I say that, I, I, I have people looking at me in amazement, but it's true. Uh, secondly, um, for me, what's important is this notion of, um, you know, when I was at business school, I was told if you want to be successful, you need to uh, think internationally and act locally. That, I'm afraid to say, is not true anymore. You cannot uh, treat, uh, I don't know, people in, in, in Georgia or in, or in Geneva or in, or, or in Paris differently than you treat them at home. We are in a completely interconnected world. Whenever something happens in the field or in an office, it is instantly global. So the idea of saying there are two types of standards, the standards you have in, in developing countries and the standards you have in developed countries, that's dead. That's not possible. No, nobody will, will, uh, will tolerate us misbehaving in a, in, a, in, in, in a different country. When I say misbehaving, I'm again putting the, the, the emphasis on the name. Negative, when in fact we should be doing the opposite. Business is a force for good in the country in which we are, if we behave properly, we are a positive force and not a negative force. And I think that's very important to understand. Business is not just there to make a profit, it's also there to spread a certain way of doing business, to spread the values, and that's what we were talking about before. Absolutely, and I think we've got one more question from Kat in South Africa that talks about that mindset uh, that you have. Hello, I just really wanted to ask Hi. you what mindsets helped you make you help to make you successful? Oh, that's, that's a huge question. <laughs> um, um, I, I think the, the well, there's a, I'm going to use a, a word which is perhaps um, not very often used in terms of business and business success. I think one thing we have to accept is that we need to be much more humble. The, the idea that we are, um, uh, as a group, as humanity, dominating the planet, extracting every possible resources and energy from where you can to get them, to force the planet, to dominate the planet, to do exactly what it is we want them to do, that is an absolute myth. 
I mean, the COVID is, is, it has, has demonstrated that this is unsustainable. I mean, imagine for that for a second. Here we are, the humanity at top of our tree. Uh, we, we, we are in the Anthropocene. Suddenly we are in a historical age, in a, in a geological age, completely dominated by humans. One little strand of RNA, something that cannot even su su survive without us. You know, uh, a virus is not even alive it does, if it doesn't have a host, has completely destroyed our model. That should teach us something. You know, if we want to be successful, we need to listen more and, so, and, and stop pretending that we know everything already. So the future is much more based on collaboration than on domination. We need to live with that virus. We need to be able to develop a future which is sufficiently broad-based and sufficiently complicated that we can react to systemic shock like, like, the, like the virus. So to increase resilience, introducing more nature into what you do is a positive thing. And that's the mindset I'm trying to, 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 to address. Nature is a collaborative effort. It's not a domination issue. Yeah. I mean, it's something that, that really comes through in everything that you say uh, is that sort of attention for nature, the, the, the attention for the balance between the human and the natural world, and also the balance between different stakeholders uh, in a company. Now, one topic that we haven't really touched upon, and, and we get a question from a couple of people, um, is, let's say, the digital world. We've talked about the natural world. We've talked about the physical world, the human world, the digital world. You know, this is, of course, affecting also um, all kinds of companies in all kinds of industries. Um, how is that, uh, asks uh, Nikola Dimitrov, a uh, student at EU Barcelona, how is digital uh, uh, affecting uh, a company like Roche and how do you see the future of pharmaceutical companies when it comes to all these digital developments that we're seeing? Well, again, an excellent question. Um, uh, the, the, you know, what we've been looking at now, we've been piling up negative things uh, on top of each other. You know, the world is not really a very happy place. We need to change the system. We need to sort of deal with the loss of nature. We need to deal with the climate change. We need to deal with the pandemic and its financial consequences. We need to deal with the psychological consequences of the pandemic. All of this will require better understanding of how our systems work. We need to be more in charge than we have been until now. So this, you know, um, is, a, is a, alongside the, the, the humility I've been, I've been talking about before. We need to listen more. And digital, uh, digital information, in particular supported by artificial intelligence, will help us to do this. Um, the flows of data that we now have and that we're able to manage and to use in, a, in an insightful way is, um, is an incredible uh, step forward into the way we apprehend the people, the, the, the thing around us. It's, it's at the beginning, it's happening more and more quickly. Um, in pharmaceuticals, it's helping us in the clinic, it's helping us to identify what the disease is really and how we can uh, deal with the disease on, on, on a, you know, in a successful manner. But it is also telling us where the health system is not functional by, by being able to analyze and follow the patient journey at all steps of its interface with the system, we can identify where we can bring in some, some, some better solutions. The, the current model of pharmaceutical is based on expensive um, uh, pathology that, uh, for, 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 for people who can afford to pay. Uh, out of the 10 billion people on the planet in 50 years time, not all of them will be able to pay the sort of money that, that our technology requires now. So we need to understand how we can prevent disease much more than how we can cure it. And, yeah. and that, that, that particular uh, aspect of the pharmaceutical industry is something that will be greatly helped by data management. Our company has now changed its model. We, we are no longer just uh, um, uh, pharmaceuticals, so production of molecules, and diagnostics or production of tests, but we are also investing heavily into data. How can we link this all up? Also with, with, with sociological data, it doesn't have to be just medical. And how can we bring all that together to, to have a, a better influence on the, on the health ecosystem? Excellent. So it's, 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 a, it's, an, it's a colossal change and it will change all sorts of things. And I'd be delighted to talk more about this, but... Yeah, we're almost at the end, of course, of our uh, meeting with you. I think a lot of people got inspired, um, André, about what they per perceive as being a genuine ethical uh, perspective that you bring to the table. Now, there's a little bit of a dissonance I've noticed in the questions from the students between seeing somebody who leads or has such an influential voice in a pharmaceutical company who seems to be so ethical and this general uh, perception of the industry and the pharmaceutical industry is often being unethical. Could you talk to us a little bit more about how you see that 
uh, perceived distance. Do you agree with that, uh, with that perspective that, that, that it's there, that perception? And, and do you think it's fair? Is it unfair? Um, you know, are you the exception to the rule or, or how do you see it? So, so <clears throat> two things here again. Uh, um, I, I, I have spent a lot of my time with a feet in both camp, in the NGO camp um, and in the big business. Uh, uh, 26, 25 years, sorry, as a vice chair of what? No, not 25 as a vice chair, but 25 on the board of work. And, and a, a lot of time also NGO. And I also personally, through our family foundation, support some conservation projects, and while at the same time investing into startups. So this division of the world on saying, you know, there is good people who spend money and there is bad people who make money, that, 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 that division is just not appropriate. You know, we are all humans. Um, this, this, this is schizophrenia. You know, I go home, I have a glass of wine with my friends. We have a good time together. We talk about the future. We wear it. Some of us um, go to bed. The next day they go to the office, they close the door. And the only thing that matters is how do I make my budget? How do I make my margin? I'm going to kill, I'm going to rape, I'm going to do everything I have to do in order to get that margin because that's how I'm being evaluated. If I don't do it properly, I'm out of business. And that thinking is frightening. You know, it, within, a, within a company, you should be allowed to live your values. If you're, if you're happy to chat about the future with your friends, why can't you bring that in the office? Why do you have to be a bastard to be successful? You know, right. if, if, you can, if you can sort of encourage this, this, this attitude of uh, um, a value-driven employer, somebody who is even, going to be able to, to, to give you the room to expand yourself, I mean, that's fantastic. But I'd, I'd like to, to, to for, 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 the, for the second part, I'd like to quote Indra Naui. I don't know if you remember Indra. Indra was the CEO of Pepsi-Cola. Um, she, she, she made a wonderful remark one day. Um, uh, you know, if you really want, in the, in the, in the long run, if you really want to have an impact on the planet, and I suspect all of us want to do that. We want success. We want to have recognition for what you're doing. But you really need to understand that it's not the way you spend the money that matters, it's the way you make it. And, and, and for me, this notion that um, uh, everything is possible in order to get the money that you then get to society who will cure the problem is the wrong way around. You need to start at the beginning. Let's make money in a way which doesn't produce the problem that need to be solved after the drive. Mm -hmm. So let's make money in a sustainable, value-driven way. We treat people fairly. Uh, we, we, we don't overprice um, uh, our products. We, we don't destroy the forest if one tree would be enough. We, we stay humble. And that's how we're going to be able to really make a difference. As you can see, it's a huge paradigm shift. I think it's, uh, there's no better way, uh, André, to end uh, your message to all of the students from AU um, that it's important to be value-driven also, and perhaps particularly in the way you uh, act in business and as a, a human being. André, thank you so much for your time, for the hour that you spent with us. I think we all learned a lot. We all learned a lot about you, about your company, and about the values that you have. And I think we all get very, very inspired by it. So, André, Thank you on behalf of everyone at EU for having joined us. Well, thank you very much to all of you to have listened to me. If you have more questions, email them to, 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 to whoever is in charge and I'll, I'll try to answer later. Be careful what you wish for. I'm sure there's a lot more questions coming your way, André. But again, thank you so much. And now back over to Luc in Geneva. Dear Mr. Hoffman, dear Peter, thank you very much. Uh, this hour flew by in no time. Uh, I wish we had another hour to answer the different questions we had. Thank you for sharing your vision and your, and, and your values, Mr. Hoffman. I think we all had a, a, a great lesson of uh, humanity as well. And you have really set the tone for the learning of leader series for this next season. So on behalf of the entire EU community, thank you for that. Uh, next for us is in two weeks already, Peter, we see each other back on the 23rd of October to welcome Amar Barada, an alum of EU Business School, and is the COO of Manchester City Football Club. Another great talk. I'm looking forward to this one. Stay safe, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us today.